Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Zemlin. I'm the executive director of the Linux Foundation. Welcome to Open Source Summit Japan and Automotive Linux Summit. We're really excited to be with you today, albeit virtually, and we have a great couple of days planned. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors with a special thank you to our diamond sponsor and event co-host, Automotive Grade Linux, and also our platinum sponsors, Fujitsu, Hitachi, NEC, SUSE, Toyota, and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Also, a quick reminder about our event code of conduct. Though we are virtual, everyone will have numerous opportunities to collaborate and engage with each other and attendees throughout the event. Please ensure that you've read and abide by our code of conduct, which in short says that all attendees should feel safe, welcome, and included at the event. If anyone has issues, or witnesses anything during the event that violates our code of conduct, please message our event staff right away. We certainly miss seeing all of you in person, and I thought I would spend some time today giving an update on the Linux Foundation. 2020 has been a tough year for us, as it has been, I'm sure, for all of you. But I'm proud to say that our team and our communities have worked through it all. When the pandemic first began and we started locking down, we went virtual right away, hosting hundreds of events all over the world like this one we're attending today. We increased our mentoring programs to help people reskill during this terrible time of uh, economic pain, provided free training. We helped in the United States fix the U.S. unemployment systems, which were written in COBOL 50 years ago and apparently hadn't been updated in a long time. We stood by uh, all our communities to chip in where we could. Most importantly, we directly are helping right now lead open source efforts to combat COVID-19 through our exposure notification effort in the Linux Foundation Public Health Initiative, which was incubated, founded, and run by the late Dan Kahn. We prov have provided clear communication throughout this pandemic in the midst of an escalating trade conflict about the free and open nature of open source and the fact that it was not subject to many of the export administration regulations we saw emerging during this conflict. We've started social justice initiatives to remove racially charged language from our source code around all of our communities, led by Priyanka Sharma, the executive director of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. We created the FinOps Foundation to help with cloud financial management. We brought in the FinTech Open Source Foundation, Finos, and now have a major set of initiatives in the financial services sector. We added hundreds of open source projects, hundreds of new members, more than one a day. We used open data to fight climate change in the financial markets by helping share data in order to estimate the impact of global warming on long-term financial markets and instruments. We used open source code to create a smarter grid through the LF Energy Initiative. We started a new open source security initiative. We address natural disasters with earthquake early warning systems through our open EEW project and many, many more. And finally, we lost a good friend. Dan Kahn, former executive director of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, GM of our Linux Foundation Public Health Initiative, sadly passed away in November of cancer. And we all will miss him dearly and his impact that he's had on our communities and yours. This year, we're starting with these virtual events, but as the vaccine becomes globally available and it's safe to get back together, our Intrepid event team is going to work to create hybrid virtual and physical experiences, taking the best of virtual events, which has allowed us to reach a lot of new people in places where we may not have been able to travel, but has certainly been something that we still have looked at in-person events and missed you all. We thought, why not combine the best of both worlds so we can 
meet both in person and extend our event experience to virtual attendees throughout the world. Our project growth really accelerated in 2020. We now host over 450 of the world's most important shared software development initiatives, ranging from Linux to Kubernetes to Node.js. We're the world's largest certificate authority with Let's Encrypt. We host open hardware initiatives like RISC-V and Open Power. We have open data sharing initiatives like LF Climate. We have initiatives in artificial intelligence, blockchain, and many, many more. Our organization continues to engage and reach out into new wholesale industries who for the first time are engaging in open source. Whether it's telecommunications, financial services, energy and climate sector, or the film and motion picture industry with the Academy Software Foundation. Our organization is working with industries to harvest the power of the community and open source. To give you an example of just how much work goes on in Linux Foundation communities, I thought I would share with you a few statistics that we recently came up with by looking across all our projects. It is amazing to think that we see a million pull requests annually. More than 31 million lines of code and 20 million lines of code are both added and removed weekly at the Linux Foundation. This is the work of over 200,000 developers from 19,000 companies across 12,000 repositories. And these aren't just any repository. This is the most important code used to create automotive systems, cloud computing, telecommunication that we all depend on, and much, much more. We've worked to scan repositories in order to unearth vulnerabilities and provide recommended fixes. We've seen millions of chat messages sent across our communities as people make decisions about what goes into this source code. Our email lists consist of millions of participants. We've processed th tens of thousands of contribution agreements to make sure that the intellectual property in our project is properly maintained and much, much more. The scope and breadth of everything we're doing here at the foundation is unprecedented in the history of computing. I want to men, uh, highlight a project I mentioned earlier that was started by Dan Kahn. Our Linux Foundation Public Health Initiative is now, now has participation from 19 states in the U.S. and over 20 countries worldwide. It's being deployed to allow people to install a simple application on their mobile device and to be able to get notification if they've been in proximity with someone who's tested positive for COVID-19. In places like Ireland, Canada, New York State, this has significantly reduced the spread of COVID-19, albeit we still have a tough effort in front of us to continue to be vigilant about the COVID-19 pandemic. Another project I wanted to highlight was our security initiative. This year, the Linux Foundation brought together multiple open source security initiatives from our core infrastructure initiative to open source security efforts hosted by GitHub, Microsoft, Google, and others. The Open Source Security Foundation is looking across the world's most important open source projects to identify security threats, provide secure tooling and best practices, provide a more efficient way to report vulnerability disclosures in these great shared open source projects, and much, much more. I really look forward to seeing more work out of the Open Source Security Foundation in the days and years to come. Finally, the Linux Foundation has invested in a new way to engage with your community. This month, we're releasing what we're calling LFX, LFX is a set of tools that allows you to work within your community to create more secure, more reliable, and better software for downstream consumption. In other words, we seek to use these tools to be the best upstream for both a commercial and non-commercial downstream. These tools consist of Insights, an advanced analytics tool that allows you to understand who's participating in your project, code velocity within that project, 
build velocity within that project and more. We have a mentorship platform that allows communities to pair mentors and mentees and even crowdfund sponsorships for those mentees so that they can take advantage of benefits that we offer at the Linux Foundation, supporting people in particular from underrepresented communities. Our easy CLA tool integrates easily into a developer workflow to allow developers to sign license agree uh, contribution agreements and allows companies to track those agreements in order to make sure that they're sharing the maximum amount they can and hanging on to the things that they wanna keep. Our crowdfunding tools allows open source projects to come in and ask for donations for critical projects. We have a member enrollment process that allow a, pro a project that allows our members to get time to value quicker across the Linux Foundation. We have a training portal that allows you to customize training for your organization and your project, security tooling, advanced meetup uh, functionality, and many, many more. I encourage all of you to check out our suite of tools at lfx.dev. You'll be hearing more about LFX in the coming months, and we hope that you'll use it and get a lot of value out of a much smoother and more advanced way to collaborate across so many different forms beyond an open source repository. Finally, let's hope 2021 brings us a better year. You have supported us in an amazing way in 2020, in one of the toughest years in my personal career and across the entire LF team. I wanna thank all of you on behalf of our team for your support and I hope to see you in person when it's safe in 2021. Thank you very much. And now with that, I'd like to introduce Dan Couchy, the Executive Director of Automotive Grade Linux. On behalf of AGL, Dan has accepted the following honors and awards. The CES 2019 In Innovation Awards, the Tech XLR 2018 Best Mobility Product and Service, and Frostman Sullivan Best Practices Award. He was recently named a top embedded innovator by Embedded Computing Design. And today he's gonna to provide us with an update on the Automotive Grade Linux project and the roadmap and plans for its future. Please welcome Dan Couchy. Hello everyone, my name is Dan Kochi. I'm the Executive Director for Automotive Grade Linux. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual Automotive Linux Summit and Open Source Summit 2020 event. Obviously we prefer to have these meetings uh, in person, um, but we must make do and we're glad to have you here today uh, on online and virtually. Um, I'd like to first start out by thanking all of our sponsors uh, with a specific thanks to uh, Automotive Grade Linux as the diamond sponsor of this event. So thank you to the AGL Advisory Board for approving this sponsorship. Um, I'd also like to thank our platinum sponsors, uh, CNCF, Fujitsu, Hitachi, NEC, SUSE, Toyota, as well as our gold sponsors, Panasonic and Renesas, and all of our silver and bronze sponsors. Without your support, this event would not be possible. So thank you very much for making it, uh, making this event possible. I'd like to start uh, by um, just giving an update on COVID-19 and how it relates to AGL and how it has affected or not affected AGL. Um, obviously, uh, it's been a challenging time uh, for the entire world. And the automotive industry uh, in particular uh, has been impacted, especially at the beginning of uh, COVID. Um, several of the automotive manufacturing lines were uh, closed down. Uh, production uh, came to a halt. Uh, sales were impacted. So it's been a very challenging time, uh, there's no doubt. Um, but uh, despite all of these challenges, um, I'm really uh, you know, proud and glad to um, share with you that uh, despite all this, AGL is uh, thriving and doing quite well. Um, and I'd like to give you a few updates on that. Um, first of all, in terms of the code and the community, um, 
COVID-19 uh, really has not impacted us. Uh, it's business as usual is what I would describe. Um, the uh, AGL Unified Codebase, which is our software platform, um, the progress has gone uh, on as usual. Uh, the roadmap has not been really affected. Um, all of the AGL and Linux Foundation support staff has always worked uh, from home uh, from the very beginning. Um, we were built to do this project and, and this development in a remote fashion from day one. Um, so all of our tools, our online co collaboration, our mailing lists, um, all of these uh, really has enabled us to continue working on AGL in a normal fashion, uh, pretty much unaffected by COVID in terms of the code and in terms of the community. Um, so that's a very positive thing. Um, in terms of membership, uh, we did lose five members uh, year to date. Uh, some of those were possibly related to COVID. Uh, for example, we had one company where their headquarters was actually in Wuhan uh, in China and uh, they did not renew their membership. So I uh, would assume that that was related in terms of business. Um, but the good news is we've added uh, 13 new members uh, since COVID began. And so that's uh, over uh, one member per month. And we're expecting probably another four or five members uh, before the end of the year. Uh, so I would say this, given the environment that we're in, um, this is quite good. Um, so there is that, that very positive note. Um, we now have over 160 members uh, at AGL. Um, this is, uh, I think, approaching starting to approach a, a local peak, I would call it, where most of the automotive uh, companies that are involved in the automotive industry are already members of AGL. What we're starting to see now is what I would call companies that are at the periphery. So companies that are into software services or cloud and wanna be part of this ecosystem. These are the types of companies we're now starting to attract, but the core AGL membership uh, in terms of the OEMs and tier ones, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, I would say uh, the vast majority of those companies uh, already uh, as members. Um, and I, I don't expect that to change. Uh, so that's also very positive. Uh, so I would say also uh, in terms of membership, uh, it's been uh, business as usual, which uh, in this case uh, is good news. Um, in terms of uh, recent milestones, so we're really, really uh, excited to announce uh, that uh, AGL UCB 10.0, can you believe it, 10.0, Jumping Jellyfish, which is the code name, uh, was released on September 24th. And one of the key things about this uh, release is that for the first time ever, uh, we're using uh, Yocto 3.1, which is a long-term supported uh, branch of uh, Yocto, uh, or release, I should say, of Yocto, and the code name is Dunfell. And so we're basing AGL on Yocto 3.1, and with Yocto 3.1 long-term support, that means we are able now to offer uh, long-term support in terms of all of the VSP and the boards, all the board support package, and uh, and all of the the kernel and the fixes that we're going to get from Yocto. Uh, we're able to transfer that uh, entire support process to uh, AGL and our releases uh, as well. And so we're really, uh, really happy to see that this transition has occurred. Um, for complete details on Jumping Jellyfish, you can find the release notes uh, on our wiki, which I've included here at the bottom of this slide, uh, wiki.automotivelinux.org. Um, so, with this milestone, you know, for some reason, 10.0 is always a big milestone. Uh, the iPhone 10 was a big deal. Uh, Android 10 was a big deal. You know, so uh, I thought, um, you know, what a what a great segue to maybe uh, review uh, the historical timeline of AGL and how we got here. Um, and so we started, AGL started in 2012, uh, believe it or not. That's been a long time. Um, it was born as a Linux Foundation work group, uh, mostly focusing on specification and not really focusing, focusing on code in the beginning. Um, 
then you know that work went on to be honest it was kind of, it seems like it was kind of a slow start um and uh there were some companies involved obviously uh but it was a bit of a slow start and then in 2014 um i joined uh, linux foundation and we rebooted the project what does that mean well we rebooted the project into a full-blown what we call linux foundation collaborative project so what that means is that collaborative projects have a very specific structure. Uh, we created a new charter, we created an advisory board, um, and we uh, created this whole new um, uh, membership benefit, uh, if you will, with all member meetings um, and developer uh, uh, meetings and hack fest and things like that. So we really took it to the next level. Uh, and uh, in the very first, uh, I would say, uh, six, seven months, we surpassed 50 members and four automotive manufacturers. So that was a really, really good start. Um, by uh, February 2015, we held our very first all-member meeting. And I remember fondly, it was at the Toyota facility uh, in Tokyo, and we had just 40 people, <laughs> uh, 25 companies in attendance. Uh, it was our very first uh, attempt at this all member meeting. And so uh, looking back, it was quite small, but quite, uh, quite the milestone. Um, and in May, we uh, released the AGL specification uh, 1.0, and that was announced uh, at Automotive Linux Summit. Um, and then in June, um, we announced uh, our new strategy and we called it the code first strategy. And what that meant is that we decided we're going to build our own software platform uh, from uh, the very, you know, from scratch. Um, and we decided to kick off this work at a uh, meeting in San Jose, in downtown San Jose. Uh, and we decided to name uh, this software platform, the UCB, Unified Codebase, to indicate to the world that we were trying to unify um, code from several different sources, you know, uh, at the time, there was a lot of efforts going on in the industry. Uh, there was uh, Geneva, Tizen, uh, uh, there was, uh, you know, general uh, generic open source projects with code that could be reused. And we really wanted to indicate that UCB is going to unify those things. And what's really remarkable is that in about uh, just six months, uh, we were able to build and release our very first UCB 1.0. So from the time we kicked off that meeting in San Jose and started selecting open source software packages and putting together this uh, new distribution and new uh, you know, software stack, uh, it took six months. Uh, that was just amazing to me. And we announced it at CES in Las Vegas in 2016. So that was UCB 1.0. Fast forward a little bit and um, in 2017, in May, we announced uh, that the very first vehicle to use uh, AGL in production uh, was being released. And we uh, again announced that at uh, Automotive Linux Summit um, that summer. And uh, in December 2017, uh, AGL surpassed 100 members and became the third largest collaborative project at Linux Foundation. Uh, so in three short years, uh, we went from uh, a handful of members to 100 members and, uh, and becoming the third largest uh, project uh, at Linux Foundation. Um, fast forward to 2018, uh, we started getting a lot of industry recognition. Uh, AGL won the prestigious Tech Accelerate Award uh, in the UK uh, for the connected car category. We were really proud of that. Uh, and then in July, uh, this is key because we announced that we were now branching out into not just infotainment, but also into instrument cluster and telematics. And we created those uh, UCB profiles. In uh, 2019, in January, we, uh, we had our very first booth at CES and we were awarded the Frost Sullivan Award for best in show um, for our category, which was a remarkable achievement. Um, in April that year, Volkswagen Group uh, joined AGL, which uh, was a, a, a huge milestone because Volkswagen Group being one of the largest automotive uh, OEMs in the world, uh, joining the group really added a lot of uh, you know, uh, credibility to AGL. 
Uh, and then in July, we, uh, for the very first time, surpassed 1,000 attendees at Automotive Linux Summit. And there were 41 countries in attendance uh, at that meeting. And so by 2019, you can see the momentum. AGL was really on a roll. And we surpassed over 150 members with 11 uh, car manufacturers. Then 2020, uh, <laughs> of course, uh, the beginning of the year was great. Uh, we announced that uh, Subaru uh, was using AGL in production. So we received a lot of uh, press and a lot of uh, media attention uh, with that announcement. Um, and we also announced uh, UCB 9.0 at CES. And then of course, in February, uh, COVID hit the world. Um, at least that's when it started to uh, really have an impact. Um, but like I said earlier in my presentation, um, it really has not affected our software, our ability to, to develop software, which to be frank is a uh, testament to the open source development methodology, which is uh, people can work remotely. We use tools, we use uh, um, um, capabilities that allow us to uh, not be, uh, not have to be in the same room. And so that's really good. And that's what uh, resulted in UCB 10.0 being released uh, pretty much on time uh, as planned. And uh, so we're, we're celebrating UCB 10.0. Uh, what a great milestone. Uh, and then we also introduced uh, the product uh, readiness profile, which I'll talk about in uh, coming up uh, in a few slides here. So earlier in the year, the uh, steering committee had several meetings over the course of the first uh, three, four months of the year. Uh, to try to strategize and prioritize what we're going to be working on for the coming 12 to 18 months. Uh, and I'd like to summarize it in this fashion here. Very simply, uh, we want to reduce the amount of demo code and demo apps that we've been producing. And what I mean by that is um, we did have for uh, a small period of time, a lot of focus on those things so that we could attend uh, conferences like CES and have at least some demo applications to show. Um, but uh, the steering committee, the advisory board would like us to reduce those efforts. So that's, that's obviously what we're doing. Um, the strategy also is to continue, uh, uh, meaning, uh, you know, continue full force on the things that we've already been working on, which is uh, the unified code base, uh, the IVI profile, and increasingly uh, important is the instrument cluster because um, one of the big differentiations of AGL versus other solutions like let's say Android is that uh, we can support multiple applications in the cockpit, uh, instrument cluster, uh, heads up display, telematics, as well as IVI. And so that's a big differentiation uh, compared to other uh, solutions like Android. Uh, you can consolidate everything on one platform and support one software base with different profiles. And so we think that's very advantageous. So we're continuing on that uh, and, and, uh, and continuing to fund that effort, uh, which is being led by uh, Suzuki uh, is leading that expert group. And then uh, finally, we plan to increase our uh, effort investments in uh, the UCB production readiness uh, in long-term support, which I've talked about by us aligning with uh, Yocto long-term long -term support, uh, as well as virtualization, uh, specifically Vert.io, which is uh, uh, the, the virtualization expert group is being led by Panasonic. And uh, we think that's a very uh, critical part of what AGL is working on because uh, it enables us, again, to consolidate multiple functions in the cockpit, uh, potentially running on the same processor um, using a virtualized uh, environment. Um, this is very forward thinking. It's very new uh, way of thinking and uh, it is gaining a lot of momentum in the automotive, automotive industry and AGL is already um, uh, showing support for this and we're ready for the, you know, the next wave of evolution of the cockpit architecture um, by supporting all of these uh, functions. So speaking of the AGL product ready profile, so you're gonna see this in uh, a lot of AGL uh, discussions uh, in the coming year. Um, basically what it is, is that Toyota contributed a lot of code from their production software base. And um, in, it was uh, just a whole bunch of code that is too much to 
immediately integrate into UCB. So what we've done is we've created a production ready UCB profile. And the goal is to integrate all of that code, the code, you know, the, 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 the bits and the, and the modules and the packages that we want and think that are beneficial to AGL over the next 12 to 18 months with of course, uh, Toyota's assistance. And the goal is to have a single UCB baseline to be as close to production ready as possible, which I'm sure is, is uh, critical for a lot of tier ones and OEMs in the industry uh, to have the software base to be as close to production ready as possible. Um, the current status is that the code contribution is underway. Um, there's been several reviews uh, that have already been completed. Um, and we expect the product ready profile to become available uh, in the coming weeks. And uh, you're gonna hear a lot more about this in our uh, weekly conference calls, uh, developer conference, conference calls that are uh, happening every week and also in our mailing list, et cetera. So if you do hear this, sometimes you'll see it abbreviated as PR. Uh, it doesn't stand for uh, PR in terms of marketing, it stands for uh, product ready uh, profile. Um, so uh, please stay tuned for more uh, news on that uh, as the year goes on. Uh, UCB 11.0, which is code name uh, Kuki Koi. Uh, the planned release for that is February 2021. Uh, you can find uh, details on Kuki Koi on our roadmap, which is at the wiki.automotivelinux.org, uh, which is listed here at the bottom. Um, so please uh, visit that page for uh, full details on Kuki Koi. Um, on, in other news, um, AGL uh, uh, earlier uh, this year uh, joined the ELISA uh, project um, and uh, we're participating um, in the new automotive work group that has been announced. Uh, in case you're not familiar with ELISA, uh, ELISA is uh, working on um, safety critical applications, so functional safety for things like uh, industrial applications, nuclear power plants, train control systems, uh, and of course cars. And cars and, and automotive are a big part of that. And AGL is helping in uh, driving the requirements for the automotive portion of those things. And the goal of the project really, uh, the concrete goal in terms of AGL is we hope to bring our instrument cluster solution uh, eventually to a, a functional safety certification and all of the uh, artifacts and testing and documentation that are going to be used to reach that certification will be shared with the AGL community so that other automotive manufacturers and their tier one partners can go and get certified um, with the same base code that, that, um, that we're, we're building. And so the instrument cluster will be uh, the first that we're targeting uh, for this uh, functional safety uh, application. Uh, also earlier in the year, AGL joined the Yocto project as a gold member. Um, and we're on the uh, Yocto governance uh, board. Um, given that uh, AGL depends uh, heavily on uh, Yocto in terms of, uh, you know, our base uh, hardware board support packages. Um, and the fact that Yocto has announced uh, a new strategy for long term support, uh, we felt it was appropriate for AGL to join. Uh, as a goal member and to support Yocto, but also to have a voice uh, in terms of uh, influencing the direction uh, to benefit uh, AGL and all of its members. Um, so we're now uh, part of the Yocto project. Um, in other news, uh, CES uh, 2021, of course, because of COVID has gone uh, virtual. Uh, so AGL and the advisory board has decided to not attend the virtual event uh, in, uh, in this cycle. Um, we had secured a large booth uh, in the automotive technology section of, of CES, um, but the virtual event really doesn't meet our needs because our booth was intended to show demos from, uh, you know, 15-ish uh, different companies uh, in a virtual environment, it just doesn't work. And so uh, we felt that it wasn't uh, appropriate for us to attend, but I have great news. Uh, I know it's over a year away, but uh, we're already excited about uh, the fact that we're gonna be attending CES 2022. And I thought I would announce that here because uh, these things take uh, long-term planning. Um, so we secured a booth 
uh, just a few weeks ago. In fact, we secured a booth in the uh, automotive technology area. And you can see here the green um, booth here, AGL, uh, which is not far from, as you can see, SAIC, uh, Fiat Chrysler, Nissan, um, General Motors, Toyota, Hyundai, Daimler, uh, you know, Audi, uh, who's who of automotive is all around us. And so we're really uh, excited about this new booth location. And if you're uh, interested in uh, participating in our booth uh, next time around, uh, I know it's a year away, but we're going to be starting actually in the first quarter of the year uh, planning uh, the booth and planning uh, demos and so on. So stay tuned for that. You're going to hear more news from me and from, uh, from our mailing list uh, on how to participate uh, and provide a demo in our booth if you're interested. In terms of uh, AGL and our meetings for 2021, um, the first all member meeting of the year we decided will be virtual. Uh, it's uh, planned for the week of March 15th, but this has not been 100% uh, confirmed yet. So please wait for the official announcements. Uh, and the event will occur in uh, Japan time zone because it was uh, scheduled to be originally be in, uh, in Japan. Uh, and then the second AMM uh, will be uh, actually at this point, we're planning for a physical event. So an in-person event, COVID permitting, and of course, vaccines permitting. Uh, but for now, our planning is moving forward uh, for the week of July 12th, uh, which is uh, before the Olympics, so it should not conflict with the Olympics. Uh, and it's uh, in Germany. Uh, we haven't decided which city, but we're favoring uh, Berlin at this point as our first choice. And uh, uh, stay tuned for details on that. And we certainly hope, cross your fingers, we certainly hope that uh, we'll be able to have it uh, in person uh, this time around. So uh, I'd like to just uh, close here by, um, you know, thinking about the last uh, uh, six years and the fact that uh, we now have 11 OEMs supporting AGL, which accounts for about 60% of worldwide annual uh, vehicle shipments. Um, we're just really proud that we've come through this difficult time of COVID um, and difficult time for the world with, uh, with still uh, thriving and still growing. Um, and we really wanna thank all of these automotive companies for supporting the project and for making AGL, uh, you know, this vision of AGL as being the future uh, platform for uh, automotive technology. Um, with that, uh, there is one more thing, and that is that actually uh, the total will soon be 12 automotive manufacturers. Um, we are not ready to announce it here today, but uh, there will be another OEM joining. Um, we're finalizing that now, and this will be announced uh, in January. Um, so stay tuned for that. We're uh, excited to be able to add uh, another OEM to this list. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to just uh, conclude by saying uh, thank you for joining us uh, this week here at Virtual Automotive Linux Summit, and we hope you have a great event and uh, join us also uh, later today, uh, uh, Walt, myself, and Jan Simon uh, of AGL will uh, be hosting a Ask the Experts uh, panel uh, session where you can ask anything about AGL. So if you have any burning questions, uh, please uh, join us uh, later today for that session. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And again, thank you to all our sponsors uh, for making this event possible. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan, for the uh, update of AGL and the great talk. As Jim mentioned, uh, it is great to have you all here. My name is Nori Fukuyasu. I'm the uh, VP of Japan Operation at uh, Linux Foundation. I will be a host from now on to the rest of the event. So our next speaker is Ken Komiyama. Komiyama-san is a manager in the Linux development system at Fujitsu. He has more than 10 years of experience uh, working as a Linux support engineer, supporting uh, the customers of mission critical system in the uh, global market. He is now leading the Linux technical support team, which supports 70,000 plus Linux servers 
including uh, mission critical systems. Today, uh, he will discuss Fujitsu's challenge with the uh, open source community. With that, uh, please welcome Ken Komiyama. Hello, I'm Ken Komiyama, and manager in the Linux development division at Fujitsu. I have more than 10 years experience working as a Linux support engineer. I'm now leading a Linux technical support team, which supports around 70,000 Linux servers. Today, I'm going to talk about Fujitsu's challenge with open source community. One of the exciting news in this year is definitely going to be the great achievement by supercomputer Fugak. Fugak is jointly developed by Liken and Fujitsu and the success of K-Computer. K-Computer ranked first on the top 500 in 2011. Fugak remains world's fastest supercomputer in international rankings released twice a year in 2020, becoming number one in the following four categories. Top 500, HPCG, HPR AI, and Graph 500. Fugak is not just the fastest and also provides high versatility. With K-Computer, the customized Linux was provided based on our Fujitsu hardware specification. Meanwhile, Fugak is compliant to ARM specification. Fujitsu has worked together with Linux community and promoted the standardization in Linux on ARM. Doing this will increase the versatility of Fugak such as possibly learning various applications. So we think solving global social problems and making innovation are expected by using Fugak. In the next, I introduce difficulties and good points from operating systems point of view. As a result of great achievement in Fugak, there were lots of difficulties. I introduce one difficulty as always noise reduction to achieve the higher computing performance. OS noise, the internal behavior of OS, causes the delay of application behavior. OS need to be aligned with Linux standards. It made us a lot difficult for tuning to reduce OS noise because any code change has to be accepted by Linux community. Important thing for the high performance of the parallel computing system is to reduce the waiting state of computing jobs. As the light diagram shows, without always noise, you can see computing jobs end at the blue vertical line. But with always noise, it causes a waiting state and computing jobs end at the red vertical line. The delay due to always noise was obvious and it's a huge impact for the performance. So we had tuned the system, not computing jobs getting to the waiting state by controlling the behavior of many processes and the behavior of memory purge in OS. This case shows how our engineer skill contributed to the highest performance achievement. What about good point in OS quality? As we chose OS to be aligned with Linux standards, that makes possible to deliver the latest security and critical bug fixes. It contributes to stable quality in operating system. And we encountered hang up bug due to the lack of huge pages. The bug was resolved a short time by discussing the resolution in the Linux community. We Fujitsu developed services and products under Fujitsu's vision as driving a trusted future and the trusted future will be consist of goal-oriented, human-centric, and creation trust through innovation. We think Fugaku represents our vision, and then open source software enables to do that. Here's an example that various Fujitsu services and products utilize open source software. Digital Anila, it's a new architecture inspired by quantum and quickly identifies optimal solutions. Jinlai Deep Learning System is a Fujitsu AI solution. Prime HPC, FX1000, FX700, 
These are supercomputers using Fukuoka technology. And of course, there are more. So I can tell that we Fujitsu challenge with open source community to develop software which makes innovation and contribute to society's growth. And we are looking forward to working together with many of you in the open source community. Thank you very much for viewing my presentation. Please enjoy Open Source Summit. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Komiyama san. Our next speaker is Bill Mulligan from Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Bill Mulligan is a marketing manager for CNCF, and his mission is to tell the story of the Cloud Native community to world to wide audience. Today, he will share how telco and edge infrastructure powered by cloud native technology is helping the world stay connected through the very difficult time of COVID-19. So please welcome Bill. Welcome to Open Source Summit Japan and Automotive Linux Summit. I'm Bill Mulligan and I work at the CNCF. Today I'm talking to you from Berlin, but I'm gonna tell you about how Cloud Native is still keeping us connected. However, before I do that, let me take you back about four years ago when the CNCF was just starting and another phenomenon was sweeping the globe. I'm talking about Pokemon Go. Remember walking around all summer and seeing people playing in parks, on sidewalks, and even in stores. It brought people together in a way few technologies have. However, what wasn't talked about as much was how cloud native technologies held the game and all of us together. From the expected traffic to the 5x worst case, the 50x traffic the game actually received was way beyond the engineer's wildest imaginations. So how do they keep the game and all of us connected? Cloud native technologies like Kubernetes allowed them to scale to meet the demands of their users around the world and bring us all together for a summer. Since then, cloud native technologies have been on a similar trajectory. Around the world, there are 6.5 million cloud native developers with 1.8 of those coming in just the past year. CNCF has also seen remarkable growth. We are now backed by over 600 members, including leading Japanese technology companies like NEC, NTT Data, and Fujitsu. Not only that, but CNC CNCF also has the largest end user community of any open source ecosystem in the world. These are the companies like Toyota that use cloud native technologies in production on a daily basis to connect us all. They're all members because they wanna keep connected to the most exciting open source projects. CNCF hosts over 70 projects, including some of the fastest moving open source projects in the world, like Kubernetes, Prometheus, and Envoy. Its sandbox projects also represent the emerging areas of technologies that will shape tomorrow, like OpenYurt for edge computing and OpenTelemetry for observability. CNCF connects people, projects, and production to create healthy open source ecosystems. However, not everything is connected in the world of cloud computing, and this year has thrown a number of hurdles at our community and the world at large. COVID is the reason we can't all be here together at a Linux Foundation event that the events team works to flawlessly pull off for us. It also presented a massive technological challenge as many people work from home and need to rely upon telecommunications to stay connected throughout lockdown. Spotify traffic, for instance, has increased over 1400% since the beginning of the pandemic and AT&T network traffic has seen peaks 50% higher than previously recorded. Some of the telecommunications companies have even had to degrade their service to keep up with the network demands, even though it is the thing that is keeping us all connected to each other. Companies using cloud native technologies have been able to adapt to this digital transition because of the robust automation and resilient systems that cloud native technologies to create. To their user, however, it looks like their service works frictionlessly and it can improve quickly these companies will become tomorrow's leaders. The Black Lives Matter protests have also affected communities around the world and the CNCF is no different. 
If our mission is to create sustainable open source ecosystems that are accessible to everyone, we need to understand what barriers are stopping people from contributing today. Cloud Native is a community of doers, and we are already hard at work to overcome these hurdles and keep our world connected. We recently launched the CNF Working Group to help telco companies understand what Cloud Native means for them so they can keep us all connected to one another. We also recently launched the Inclusive Naming Initiative to enable the industry to remove harmful and unclear language by providing tangible solutions and tools to them. These initiatives have been driven by the community of CNCF, which is the foundation of doers. We want to keep the world connected and let everyone have a seat at the table so when the next Pokemon Go is created, it can once again bring the whole world together for a summer. We are a diverse community of doers and we want you to join us. Find a project to get involved with or find us at KubeCon next year. Let's keep Cloud Native connected and have a great conference. Please feel free to reach out to me if you wanna connect with me. I love connecting with the Cloud Native and open source communities around the world. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Our next speaker is Thomas DiGiacomo, the Chief Technology Officer at SUSE. In his role, Thomas drives the rapid growth of SUSE's ex ex expanding portfolio from enterprise Linux operating system to software-defined products, as well as solutions for uh, developers such as Kubernetes container management and Cloud Foundry platform as a service. Thomas has more than 20 years of experience in the IT industry, servicing, uh, serving in various global engineering and product innovation leadership role. With expertise in open source platform and development, global systems and technologies apply to various industries. Today, Thomas will discuss how Cloud Native is edge native as well. Please welcome. Thomas. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this discussion about Cloud Native is Edge Native 2. I'm going to share how we are seeing and developing open source solutions that are applicable to the cloud, to core IT, and to the edge, and I will be taking Automotive as a concrete example of that. I'm Thomas Di Giacomo, Chief Technology Officer at SUSE. I should say SUSE and Rancher, as just a couple of days ago, we have announced the closing of a merger between SUSE and Rancher Labs, a leading container and Kubernetes management solution. So today, I would like to share how we see Linux and open source cloud native technologies with many of them being developed or being based on the CNCF and Linux Foundation projects and communities, how those technologies are applicable to edge use cases and specifically to modern automotive requirements. Edge computing has indeed a lot of applications and across many different industries, its adoption keeps growing. The industry would still benefit even more from further open source innovation and interoperability. Similarly to cloud computing, edge computing requires infrastructure, application, and data management benefiting from AI and ML technologies, and above all, a smooth and tight integration and connection with on-prem, private data centers, and public clouds. And while the as-a-service approach of clouds and the device-based perspective of edge may initially seem very different, they are absolutely not disconnected. To be successful, they are entirely codependent on one another. Now let's take a concrete example with connected smart cars, almost smart enough to be fully self-driving. And please bear with me for a moment. The picture of the forest shall make sense very soon as a way to visualize and represent distributed edge and cloud setups. So even though there's a lot of sensors and compute and control units inside a car, cars can be seen as the endpoints of a distributed cloud, a distributed edge architecture. In that forest, the cars would then be the leaves of the trees. And on the picture, the cars happen to be green because they are smart, they are also clean. As leaves, 
smart cars do not only collect sunshine there, but they generate a lot of data. Some of it is processed locally, close to the compute, as for instance latency is not a very good friend of driving reaction time, while some of the energy, some of the data, is going back to the branches of the trees, going back to the on-premise, private or co-located data centers of the automotive manufacturers or their partners. The data is then stored, filtered, processed and analyzed there, including for AI ML training and predictive analytics. This is a two-way street, where the leaves receive software and data, some updates and also get instructions from the branches too. And this dialogue is actually a multiple-way street, with exchanges coming from and going to the trunks of the trees as well. The trunks are public clouds that are hosting centralized data or some of the driver or some of the end-user applications, for instance. They are connecting to and with the branches and the data centers, as well as to and with the leaves, our cars. Last but not least, and I would even argue that this is the most vital and important part of the entire forest, is the ground itself, the underground. This is where the seeds and the roots of the trees are located, where they are fertilizing, nurturing and supporting the health of that entire ecosystem. And that's basically you, and users and companies, IT and developer professionals and teams, equipped with tools and processes to manage applications, data, infrastructure, security, observ observability and so on. This is the layer that makes the entire forest a possible reality. Now, let's dive a little bit deeper into the specific automotive example and the software within the car itself, starting with what the operating system of cars could be. And here, I'm going to talk specifically about the OS and Linux, obviously, in the context of the critical car infrastructure and sensors, not only for the entertainment system. For such a critical and literally vital need, we have to be able to rely on a secure, stable, real-time and safe Linux. This is very similar to some of the specific use cases, to some of the specific mission-critical workloads we do see in the traditional IT domain as well. Whether they are running in private data centers or public clouds, industries like healthcare, defense, financial services, or even generally high-performance computing and academics have very similar core requirements. Historically though, those two worlds, traditional or cloud IT and cars, have been developing pretty much independently from each other, using different sets of tools and technologies. And yes, a car is neither a data center nor a cloud, running the usual IT applications, yet there are many similarities and technologies that can actually be leveraged for both. Autonomous driving specifically means software-driven cars, and Linux can be at the heart of ensuring the performance, the safety, and the security of that software. And that requires, of course, a fully safety certifiable, a fully safety certified Linux for mission-critical automotive systems. A few months ago, at SUSE, we have partnered with Electrobit in that space. Electrobit is a leading global supplier of embedded software solutions for the automotive industry. Together, we are building and bringing the first safety certified Linux to the automotive industry, and I'm happy to be in a position to share that it is where that is, it is available and usable today. And actually, it's already making its way in real cars for 2021. We are also looking at reducing the number of ECUs from hundreds to maybe a dozen by centralizing IT at the car level itself, thanks to a zonal architecture. It features only a few central compute clusters, or maybe even just one in the future, and zonal ECUs as gateways to the sensors and the actuators. The logic is centralized, sensors and actuators becoming less smart, and the wiring is based on Ethernet ring backbone to also reduce the weight of the overall system. Now the car is software defined and can be fully updated over the air to get new features. And yes, security patches as well.
Let's put our open source enabled smart car back in its ecosystem. And that is on the roads with pedestrians and traffic, as well as being interconnected with other cars, the driver's phone, data centers and clouds. A very important of this is the overall orchestration of such a distributed environments. This is required to manage data, workloads and applications across the different elements and it should be done by minimizing human intervention, automating the creation, the delivery and the installation of images, of containers, packages and patches. Because the life cycle of this environment is going to be many, many years and because it needs to scale to millions of devices as well. This should be jointly handled and planned with placing the different compute and data components at the edge, at the core or in the clouds, depending on what they are needed for, actually depending on where they are needed even more so. Last but not least, the general orchestration and management solution should also be designed to be both modular and platform agnostic, as the environment will definitely change over time and not elements will Say, stay the same over time. Looking at the edge specifically, this starts with a reliable, secured and compliant OS, a container management and software infrastructure stack where then real-time compute and data-driven decision-making are processed. On the core and cloud sides, data mobility as well as workload portability should be ensured across hybrid and multi-cloud. Providing AI, ML and analytics there is also necessary to manage the overall distributed ecosystem together with an application delivery platform to be able to develop and push applications and their updates to where they should be hosted. And this as well is going to be dynamic and not set in stone for the next decades. So it should be flexible and transparent to the software development teams, whether they are in-house or from partners or even end users at some point, as I would love to be able to develop apps for my future car too. I'd like to go back to our forest from there and share how cloud native open source technologies are very relevant for edge use cases, including automotive, either directly or with some adaptations. And in any case, they help connect the dots with compute and application as Linux containers can virtually run anywhere. To illustrate that, let me share just a few examples of some of those projects, and there's definitely many more than that, and where those projects could sit in the forest, because each layer of the forest has a different purpose and a different set of requirements. You need to look at the right ones for the right spots. So our leaves, the edges, can be anything from a sensor, gateway to a small data center, and in our example today, a car. Usually, there are also a lot more leaves than trunks and branches, and they are much smaller. Hence, the need for lightweight optimized solutions that can be deployed and managed on thousands and millions of leaves. The leaves are also specific with industry regulations and requirements. Hence, the technologies serving them should be matching or at least accommodating that. Technologies like CubeEdge or K3S provide edge-friendly Kubernetes environments. K3S, for instance, which is a CNCF project originating from Rancho, enables you to deploy, run and manage Kubernetes clusters in a very simple and light way. Other CNCF technologies relevant at the edge include Longhorn as a very light and Kubernetes native integrated block storage backend for the applications running on the leaves. The specific needs at the leaves and cars level apply to everything, networking and connectivity, as well as the operating system with special flavors of Linux for it, as we've seen. Technologies running on specific hardware and chipsets are also often required for the leaves, with ARM being an example of that. Now going to the branches, our on-prem, private or co-located data centers, that's where you have a little more resources, more traditional computing setup and infrastructure. This is where Rook with Ceph could be a relevant storage backend, and this is where full-fledged Linux distributions and Kubernetes clusters can sit too. Then at the trunks, we have the services public clouds offer, say AKS, EKS, GKE, and others, 
covering as well networking, storage and computes and additional data and AI ML services needed. All of that has to come together. If anyone becomes unhealthy, not implemented well, not talking to the other layers properly, the entire forest is at risk. On the ground, we need to abstract this whole ecosystem as much as possible, yet manage all the diversity and scale of components within the forest. And they are living and evolving things. It cannot only be done once and forgotten for ages. And of course, edge computing networks get very large very fast as well. And it includes various types of clouds and devices. Thankfully, there are projects and technologies that give us the means to cope with all the layers via multi-cluster, multi-cloud and edge management capabilities. For instance, SUSE Manager and Rancher are enabling such kind of management at the application, at the container infrastructure and at the OS levels across the entire forest and irrespective of the types of trees you might have. AIML now is also enabling operations and improvements of such massively distributed systems. Although it can be handled in the clouds or core data centers, it's also getting closer and closer to the point of interaction to the edge. With an appropriate abstraction to simplify the use of such machine learning power for end users, we are working on technologies like AI ML orchestrators or others to enable all sorts of new use cases previously too complex to be automated and managed by data scientists or the systems that they needed to run on. In closing, I would like to remind you about a few points. First, across industries and use cases, and including automotive to a very strong and large extent, edge computing requires an integrated infrastructure and an integrated management that span from edge to core to cloud. Second, that cloud native and open source solutions are now being adapted and used for edge computing itself. And most importantly, that these advances will enable Kubernetes, Linux, and other cloud native and open source technologies to become the unifying platform that makes edge computing accessible to the world. Even if we are all remote, I hope that you can take advantage of your time here at the Open Source Summit Japan to learn more about these projects and technologies. Thank you very much for your time and stay safe. Thanks, Thomas. To close out our keynote today, uh, our next speaker is Kelista Redmond, CEO of Risk Five International. Prior to joining Risk Five International, Kelista held a variety of roles at IBM, including Vice President of IBM Z Ecosystem, where she led strategic relationships across software vendors system integrators, business partners, developer communities, and broader engagement across the industry. Today, Kalista will talk about the unprecedented changes and shifts in the semiconductor industries. With that, please welcome Kalista. Hi. I'm Callista Redmond, CEO of Risk Five International. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the unprecedented changes and shifts that we're witnessing today in the semiconductor industry. Our world is shaped by disruption. Those disruptions can be positive, negative, forecasted, come out of nowhere. What is very similar amongst all of those disruptions or challenges that we face is that when the interests are represented by only a few, it's time for that game to change. And that game needs to change whether it's a pandemic we're facing or a monopoly in a particular industry or other barriers that we put up. When those challenges become too great, it's time for the game to change. And throughout history, we can point to times where removing barriers and coming together for a united approach is what ushers in the next generation, a stronger, better, 
generation, whether that's in technology or in health or in economic or other uh, challenges that we face, including natural disasters, coming together, taking a united approach. So let's talk about Risk V and the technology that's ushering in this unprecedented revolution that we're seeing around the world. You know, if you look at legacy ISAs, they're very complex and very uh, challenging to deal with. It's partially because of how they've been built. They've been built incrementally, adding on to prior extensions and adding on and adding on until you're, you know, kind of looking at an, a, a base ISA or instruction set architecture of 1500 base instructions. We're taking a modular approach. The technology isn't new. Risk architectures have been around for decades. But what we're doing is saying, you know, your required base is only 47 instructions. Upon that, you can add extensions that fit for the challenge that you're facing or the implementation that you're seeking to build. And that makes it modular. Taking away uh, licensing and royalty fees is something that makes it uh, easier to work with from a technical point of view as well as a financial point of view. And building and ushering in a design ecosystem around those innovations is where risk five really starts to bring the, the game forward we're seeing this disruption around the world and you know with technology comes opportunity and we are making sure that that opportunity is unconstrained by taking down barriers artificial or real around uh, the technology around licensing around supply chain you have expanded opportunity, both for what goes into your product, the innovation partners you work with, the supply chain that you engage, the other uh, you know, places where you can go and bring your product together. And this also expands the opportunity of where you can take your product, where you can take your innovation. You are, have more freedom to explore those adjacent spaces, adjacent markets, additional geographies, and you can take your innovations into a much greater market opportunity. So beyond removing barriers, there has to be growth opportunity. Open source is great, but if it doesn't fuel and foster growth for our members, then we're not exactly on the right track. And those opportunities are growing exponentially. You know, just in uh, June, Gartner started to comment on the growing number of custom processors that they're seeing in ASICs. You know, up from 30%, they see a you know trajectory clearly to 40% by 2025 of custom ASICs by OEMs. This is nothing new for the very large design shops or large OEMs, but it is new. It is a new starting point for entrepreneurs and other participants in this space. So. But why is this opportunity expanding? The opportunity in IoT alone uh, is forecasted to be 30 billion connected and IoT devices. So IoT connected vehicles, wearables, smart homes, smartphones, PCs, the opportunity is growing exponentially. And with that opportunity comes volumes, comes adjacent markets, comes adjacent opportunities. For risk five, we're projected to encompass 62.4 billion cores of that by 2025. And this is an ex exponential kegger, of course, uh, but this is an important strategic variable to think about. Is there opportunity to recoup the investment of building on risk five? Absolutely. It's not just that there's financial revenue opportunity, but we've reduced the risk of investing in something new because you have an entire community investing along with you. And that community spans many, many different industries. So we see a lot of advancements in cloud and data centers from Alibaba, you know, unveiling their risk five in their data centers for AI uh, specifically to other large OEMs and hyperscales that are continuing to develop on risk five. We see the growth happening in automotive, especially around safety. Uh, these uh, sensors and, and the number of processors that are going into an auto automobile is growing each generation. Industrial IoT has been one of the leaders in our area, 
along with mobile and wireless. There are dozens of processors in, in any one device, and RISC-V has a role to play there. As consumer and IoT devices become even more connected, there is growing new opportunity, as well as for memory and storage. Now, if you think about where is the adoption happening, with large multinationals, we see one toe in the water and ready to embark on more, starting in uh, replacing microcontrollers or things in existing products, but a much stronger focus in tackling new workloads around AI and other uh, implementations that are fueling and giving them a competitive advantage. For the other end of the spectrum, for startups and entrepreneurs, there has never been a better time to get into the microprocessor industry. And we're seeing that tenfold among the number of members who are signing on, uh, more than 100 today, of companies less than 500 people. So where is this growth going in our community? You know, this graph is starting to look like all the others we've seen so far, straight up. And, you know, we are today more than 750 members, actually, uh, across 50 different countries. We see this diversity across various technical interests as well as geographies. Today, we have about a third of our membership in North America, about a third in Europe, and about a third in uh, APAC. And in APAC alone, we have about a dozen or more members in Japan. We are very excited about the progress that's going on in Japan with leadership from Sony Semiconductor, Hitachi, and, and others ranging from academia to industry. We're very proud of this dedicated community. You know, at its core, building a successful technology requires a community. It requires a community of various technical expertise and interests. It requires a community of investors, of universities, research, learning, around software as well as hardware. And we also engage very deeply with the uh, press and analyst community. So Japan is really moving quickly with us and we're very proud of the results. As you can see, collaboration across interests and global uh, footprint is leading the way for Japan. We've seen great prog progress around vector processors, uh, with Renesas, uh, engaging with Andes. These are partnerships that are driving the industry adoption forward. We see this as well between uh, additional companies spanning the globe. No company is isolated to their geography, and that's one of the barriers that we bring down with RISC-V. Universities are deeply engaged as well, as you can see several examples here where Japan universities are collaborating tightly with industry and moving forward on important technical contributions to the community. Our organization, RISC-V, delivers incredible member support. We have these six programs that are there to support the success of our members. We're not here for our own goodwill, we're here for our members and our member success is what drives the in and compels the industry forward. From technical deliverables and ensuring we guard against fragmentation to compliance and architectural tests that ensure that your design and innovation uh, meets the criteria of uh, the base ISA, to visibility, amplifying not only what RISC-V International is doing, but also the success that each of our members are realizing learning and talent from universities to online learning to training partners, advocacy, meetup groups around the world engaging around 3,000 people, as well as a technical advocacy through our ambassador program, as well as a dozen or more uh, geographic and industry alliances. And finally, a marketplace exchange. This is really where we showcase the latest innovations on RISC-V and direct that traffic uh, completely back to the innovator themselves so they can go realize and grow those relationships and opportunities. I encourage all of you to consider where RISC-V fits into your strategy. Think about where it makes sense to have diversity of architectures or to start your company and mission on RISC-V. The contributions of our members are what make all of this possible and we in turn support our members in their success. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kalista. We now have a break before conference session begins at 11 a.m. in Japan time. 
So grab some coffee or a snack, then join one of our breakout sessions. And don't forget to visit our sponsor booth throughout the day. We have some great event experiences, uh, including our uh, virtual, uh, virtual photo booth, the Zen Zone, and the games. So please be sure to check them out as well. And if you run into any technical issues today, please reach out to our help desk channel on Slack. And I hope you uh, will enjoy the rest of the uh, conference today. And please uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you.